I will admit, Stargate's kind of bad. This week on Backward Compatible, Jam, Doc, and Chris discuss how audience predispositions affect the way they consume games and other media. Plus, Resident Evil 7, Star Wars Battlefront 2, The Last Jedi, and more. The Backward Compatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 116 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Good morning, maybe. <laughs> and we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And today's media topic of discussion is going to be consumer expectations. It's going to be... Uh, I didn't expect that. Predispositions. It's going to be lots of uh, stuff about how you go into a game that you're playing, or uh, maybe even beyond games, you might even touch on movies and other media, but mainly games, because we are a gaming podcast. I have lots of expectations about and, this episode. Yeah, and game franchises, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it should be an interesting discussion talking about um, how the way we go into a game, the mindset we take into the game can affect the way that we... Um, enjoy or don't enjoy it, the way that we interpret it, the way that... Yes. Um, or the way we play it, the way we actually pl- yeah, interact with the game. I mm. call this the Stargate Syndrome, but it means nothing to anyone but me. I'll explain it later. <laughs> there you go. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but first, we have some opening segments for you, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. Recently, I've been catching up on some games earlier in the year that I missed out on but was really excited for at one point, and it just kind of fell through the cracks for me, and what I want to talk about today is Resident Evil 7. So this is actually not the seventh entry in the Resident Evil series for those familiar. Wait, what? That's yeah. so confusing. <laughs> yeah, they've had a lot of spin-offs and um, side stories, like Code Veronica being one of the biggest. That's they've like had a Resident Evil Zero. That's the only one I've played is, is Zero. Oh, Zero, not, yeah, not Zero. Code Veronica? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Zero I thought was all right. Code Veronica was pretty good. Um, regardless, getting a little off topic here, but talking about Resident Evil 7, one of the big things that, or changes, I guess you could say, to Resident Evil 7 and to the franchise was that it went back to its roots with Resident Evil 7 and actually almost took a lot of um, inspiration from Silent Hill as well. So instead of being this action-oriented game that we saw in Resident Evil 4, 5, and 6, which, honestly, I think it was really only successful in 4, Um, 5 and 6 got increasingly um, more negative press and more negative attention from both fans of the series and critics. And and they've kind of gone back to their roots with 7. And in 7, they spin kind of a different story. They don't have the Umbrella Corporation. Um, It's it's very much a standalone experience. Um, You are in a... Basically, okay, so basically you are... Uh, this guy named Ethan, and you get this video from uh, your wife or fiance, I forget which, uh, Mia. And she she's missing. She went on this, tr- this you know, trip, and then she's gone, and she's basically saying, help, come come save me. And you, you, you were sure that she was alive, so when you get this, you're, you're even more convinced. It's been like over a year since she was missing. So it's a really weird experience, and you decide to go to this, uh, where she told you to go. It's this derelict plantation in Louisiana. Just in Louisiana swamps. Random. It seems that way, right? But it's a really creepy place. And you show up. And oh, I lived in Louisiana for a couple of years. Oh, I did. I, I did too. I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, not in a derelict plantation in Louisiana, though. At least I that. didn't. You don't know that. Oh, that's true. Um, so, what the story um, focuses on is this really strange family of, um, like, cannibal psychotics, I guess, oh. that have this. Um, disease of some sort that they it's referred to as the molded that kind of infects their body and makes them sort of like zombie-esque in the sense that they can't die and they're also kind of dead but they also can still communicate with you they still can speak um and they can still uh, they actually move around very quickly they're very fast and very deadly and they still retain all of their intelligence so i'm still kind of figuring out what exactly that means i just know that they're all pretty damn crazy and want to kill me uh okay <laughs> which is 
by the way, really freaking scary. Um, to talk a little bit about just the fear factor of this game, um, first of all, you don't want you have to get into into combat at various points in the game, but you kind of don't want to. It's combat's kind of scary, especially with any of the family, mm -hmm. because I mean, not only are they really tough, you're not really sure what'll kill them. I and I'm not that far. I'm into the game as I could be. And where I'm at is I've only recently killed one for good, I think. Poetry? Yeah. <laughs> um, so you, you read them poetry? I read them poetry. Yeah. No, so unlike zombies where you have to shoot them in the head or, you know, stick something through their head and damage their brain in some way and they die, these guys, you literally can, like, slice them in, in a part. You can saw through them. Uh, you can burn them alive or, or, or undead. They keep coming back. It just temporarily stops them. So this is like that fungus that takes over the worms and, and hijacks their brains? Kind of. That's, yeah. what it, that's what it feels like. It's really creepy. And, you know, I mentioned, um, this, is, this must have been, oh, geez, probably a, a show from about a year ago where I talked about playing the Resident Evil 7 demo. Yeah, I remember that. And my expectations, because you, you do things that are, I thought were cool, where you watch uh, VHS tapes of an earlier experience that, a different character had and what you do is that character actually changes the way that the house is set up like you can unlock doors yeah, and then you later a gun or something yeah, yeah and it's really cool that. you can do stuff like that and i was curious how they would apply it to the game and they really don't oh that's a shame um because we i remember the reckless speculation from that episode yeah. where we were like this could be amazing it could be revolutionary it could change everything yeah okay they, they do have the vhs tapes factor and you still play through as a different character or different characters at different moments, and you're still uncovering different parts of the house that you can then use that knowledge as your as the main character Ethan to solve puzzles. So it still happens, but and you still ex experience that tape in that way. But you're not really changing things. Like it felt almost like you were kind of retconning your experience in the demo, and you don't really get that in the the full game. Um, however, I will say the full game is interesting it's terrifying um i know what one moment to use an example because you're not sure what to expect with these guys so it at one moment they sort of like had me tied down and i was eating after they had caught me and i was eating dinner at their table which was just like rancid food and all that and uh they were essentially probably going to kill me at any point because they're all kind of crazy and then some, some something happens they have to walk outside and i'm left alone and i'm able to break out well one of the the crazy brothers comes back and he's got like an axe, and he's coming at me, and I have to. You kind of have to have play hide and seek with him because you just don't have the weapons to take him on. And so I, I'm on the other side of a wall, and I think, okay, good, he can't see me through this wall. And then he just randomly like busts through the wall because he like sensed me there or something, and starts coming after me. And I probably Here's Johnny. Yeah, I jumped like ten feet in the air. I, it freaked me out because I uh, did not expect that. It reminds me of Outlast, actually. Yeah, there, there's a lot of moments like that in the game where you just get. I mean, they are jump scares, but they're played pretty well. And the game does feel like um, a pretty effective you know, horror film that mm -hmm. you're that you're in. Um, so it really does feel like the really the earlier, the earliest, I should say, Resident Evils kind of mixed with Silent Hill. So if you're if you're into that, it's definitely worth playing. I will say that the the biggest complaint that I would have of the game, you know, because it does have a great atmosphere, really good graphics, good sound design, um, the boss fights are really frustrating because it doesn't feel like the rest of the game. And you do face minor enemies throughout the Are they the kind way. of puzzly? Or you got to figure out how to beat them or whatever? It's not that they're puzzly. It's that they're really difficult, but not in a way that makes sense. Like, to use you, one, to you, use you one didn't example. You learn through the level the skills they would take to beat the boss. Yes. The boss isn't a test. It's just its, its own it's thing. It's its own thing, yeah. right. And it's not even, like, an interesting thing. It's, it's kind no, of a frustrating a thing. Uh, to use one example, one of the, one of the brothers, uh, in fact, I think it's the one that busts through the wall that I talked about. I think he's the first kind of real boss. Um, you ha you're basically trapped in this really, really small room. Like, you know, I'm talking like four foot by four foot or something, maybe a little bit bigger, six foot, six foot. <laughs> really small room oh. with body bags hanging from the wall, from the ceiling. And you have to basically kite him around the room, like run around in a circle, because if he gets you, he's going to almost kill you in one hit. And you can't even hurt him for the first part of the fight. You have to kick body bags against him. To, to annoy him until he picks up a giant chainsaw and tries to saw you in half because when he does that, you can get your own giant chainsaw and then you have a giant chainsaw duel. You've never used a chainsaw in this game, by the way. Oh, okay. So none of this makes sense. And also, you're either hiding from enemies or just 
trying to take them out and then ducking behind something and moving moving away. You're not running people in circles. So it's a very different experience. It was actually really frustrating. And the part that pissed me off so much about it was I could not beat this 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 level. I was actually I actually had given up on the game for about a week thinking I was just not going to play it again because mm-hmm. it had been so frustrating. And just kind of on a lark, I looked online to see for strategies about how to beat it. And various people were going, oh, yeah, you, you, you can just mash the attack button on the chainsaw and just keep doing that, and it'll actually just work. You won't be able to break through. It's like, what? <laughs> what kind of strategy is that? Well, I tried it, and that actually works. So the strategy is to not use a strategy. It's to just button mash. Oh, that's a shame. See, I was thinking maybe if you stayed really still, he'd think you were one of the body bags. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. He's, <laughs> he's very aware of who you are. Oh, that's what makes that's it terrifying. Yeah. Uh, but it's still, it's still worth playing. It's just the, you're going to have to ex- accept that the boss fights are not going to be as fun. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. Since our last show, Representative Chris Lee um, from Hawaii gave a speech actually talking about the predatory behavior and um, the problems with addiction that surround loot boxes. And he did talk about them as um, related, to, at least related to gambling mm-hmm. and the fact that these these practices are um, also targeting children. Yeah. Um, and strangely, it's a really weird press conference. If you, I don't know if y'all watched it, I linked it to you. Um, but uh, it's strange because they actually bring up a Star Wars, a Battlefront fan, a video game fan, a video gamer, I should say, um, but also a fan of the Star Wars franchise and uh-huh, such. And uh-huh. he came up there to talk about some of the stuff that was going on, in, specifically in Battlefront. It was really weird. Um, and he kind of talked about his own experiences with, with you know, loot boxes and how much he disliked them. It was really awkward because he wasn't really a public speaker. He wasn't a politician. He was just some, it's like, where do they find this guy? He's just some guy. I will now bring my nephew in. <laughs> yeah. It, it sort of almost felt like that. Um, but it was an interesting speech, and it feels Feels like we're they're setting the stage right now because of the the backlash that um, not just that EA had for Battle, Battlefront Two because I think that was more like the powder keg moment, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but it's been going on for a while in sports games, both Two K Sports and EA Sports. Their games oh, yeah. have these you know loot boxes or buying packs, and it's been an issue among gamers for a while. And it's now now they've gotten the attention of you know elected officials and things are starting to happen because EA's already yeah. rolled way back what they had planned to do in Battlefront 2 in response to this. Yep. And so now we're at a point where you know th- this could have a lot of effect on the industry, not just when it comes to loot boxes, but microtransactions themselves. I mean, they could all oh, be yeah. in trouble because the companies now now might face regulation. Yeah. So here, here's my difficulty with the whole situation and taking that approach, okay? Uh, first of all, completely dislike loot boxes. Go listen to the last episode. You'll, you'll, you'll catch my opinions on that. But really, it comes down to this. Whenever you start talking gambling is I think gambling may be too narrow. Just simply because if, if there was a way to separate the idea of gambling from the addictive property that you talked about mm. – I would actually say I don't have as much problem with the idea of gambling. It's the addictive nature of it that I have the problem with. And, and of course those two are completely intertwined. So it makes no sense to speak in those terms. But I think if, what you set yourself up is, is a danger of if someone later on can legally set a precedent that this is not in fact gambling, you may have undermined your entire argument. Whereas if you go after the whole thing of, yes, this is a dangerous, addictive behavior and you, you are um, you know, kind of parasitically preying on younger gamers and, who have their mom's credit cards or however in the world it is they're paying for these things, um, that, that to me seems like a, a more firm foundation to make the argument on. But I think they're probably not doing that for one reason and one reason alone, and it's that every time video game addiction comes up in any kind of a legal term at all, it gets completely shoveled to the side. And, and it, it, there's, I mean, it's still not in the medical databases as being a legitimate disease, right? You know, but other forms of addiction are, but that one isn't. And so I find it very interesting that once again, what we're really coming up against here is the digital space problem. It's like the sort of exception to the digital space problem. It's, it, I think it has a very close tie in to the idea of, you know, a free internet, for example, right? Net neutrality and that mm-hmm. big argument that came up a couple of weeks ago. I, I really think that what we're experiencing is these birth pains of what the internet is. And we are still seeing it as a thing that we use, not a thing that is so ingrained in the things we use that we can't even 
separate it. We're tr- mm. still trying to separate it. And People have made an argument recently, or in, in recent years, I should say, for the internet being actually more of a utility. Mm-hmm. Um, and will be increasingly right. more Absolutely. so. Absolutely. And it's not I, a I service, think it's become it's like that. Electricity. Yeah. I, I, I'm with you on that. Um, and it's it's the way that some people, it's the, the way that there are some people, at least let me start the sentence over. There are some people that the majority of social interactions that they have in a mm-hmm. given day mm-hmm. are on the internet. That's right. Well, not well, even that, but just talking about like, you know, connected homes, um, anything well, that requires a network connection in order to function. Yes. And, and we're always connected now. Always, Wherever we go, always, we're yeah. connected. And, we're, and you know, shops um, and, you know, restaurants and, and stores, they get you in a lot of times by saying, hey, well, free Wi-Fi. Yeah. Try to, try to get a phone, a mobile phone that doesn't have the internet on it. Just try. <laughs> see, see where that leads you. Um, I mean, in, in, in some places in this country and all around the world, frankly, uh, you – You've got this um, sort of law that keeps people from getting their electricity shut off. And it's actually being argued in certain places that maybe it should be the same way with the internet. Because the internet is now our key to applying for a job. It's right. the way that we telecommute. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's so, how you keep the power It's on. so essential. It's so essential because I'm not – like just some of the things that, that I do, and I know a lot of Americans do this as well. Um, you know, even when I'm not at work, I'm sometimes still kind of at work. Because of all the communications that you get through the internet. Mm -hmm. So like your email or various chat programs um, are always there. And you're always able to, you know, contribute in some way, even if you're not physically there. So to connect that back to the loot box idea, Mm. basically what we're talking about is there's no physical box. There's no physical item. There's no stuff. It is all information that somehow modifies other information, which is in a video game. Therefore, obviously... It can't really be gambling. Ah, but here's the here's the little uh, um, twist on that though, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, is that people are still spending real money to get these loot boxes, and yes. that's actually when um, all these representatives started getting involved, yes. like like in different parts of the world, yes. including now in the United States, is because of that real world money element. Yeah, it was, in my opinion, it was already a predatory practice. They were already doing something that they that they that could trigger addictive behavior. Oh, I agree. Even before the actual real world money was involved, absolutely. But now that it is, it's like you're saying because it doesn't have now it has a real world component, not just a digital component. Mm-hmm. Now it's it's getting that extra attention. Yeah, yeah. and its roots lie in games like Farmville. Oh yeah, um, you a know, good example. You, you think back to 2007, and mm-hmm. and everybody was playing Farmville. Um, but I, I think that that it's more insidious than that. What we're really talking about here is um, there's a difference between, let's just, let's just call it the addictions, gambling addiction and something like cocaine. Cocaine has a physical uh, effect on your ability to process dopamine, for example. It literally makes it more difficult to get the high. And, and everybody knows that. The more you do drugs, the, the less high you're going to sure. get off the drug but, over time. But the gambling actually uses one of the psych- most important psychological principles, which is inconsistent feedback, mm-hmm. which is how you get pigeons to, you know, to get addicted to pushing a button. Yes. <laughs> and and we see this, and I, I know you mentioned Farmville, but to go even farther back, mm-hmm. we saw that in the early MMO space yes. with EverQuest, also known as um, EverCrack. EverCrack, yeah. And also World of Warcraft or World of Warcraft. War Crack. Yeah. So it's just that crack connection for some reason. Though. Yeah. Uh, but, but all <laughs> but, I'm, all but I'm those saying were, is... Those were big, right? The MMO yeah. space, I mean, there, there were people that literally died from, and this is not an exaggeration, literally died from from being so obsessed with playing the game that they never got up. Yes. For for so long they didn't they didn't sleep and their bodies eventually just gave out. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that we're making the right comparisons here. Um, and and I think when we start talking about addictive behaviors, we need to recognize that only four percent of um, gamblers get addicted to gambling, but it's a much much higher percentage that get addicted to say cocaine. Uh, right. And 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 right. so if you we have start, to have that like like that predisposition, yes, the psychological predisposition whatever. for but it. But the point is this: if we start going down that path and we start outlawing gambling practices in games, we need to be very very careful because someone could come along, reverse that re- legislation, we'd be right back where we started. And and I think that's why the 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 wording that was used, and they did mention gambling. I'm not saying they didn't, but the wording used is pred- was pre- uh, I'm sorry, the term was predatory behavior. And I love that. So it's not it's not saying okay, there in, in Belgium it did say that they're gambling as part of that yes. ruling, but both had similar wording in the sense that they were talking more about the, the predatory behavior and not so much focusing on, oh, it's gambling, therefore it's illegal. Yeah. So they just mentioned the gambling connection. I think there was some that focused too much on just that connection and not on the actual practices themselves, which yeah. is what they have a problem with. Yeah. Um, 
to talk uh, briefly about my experiences with this, I know that uh, a few years back, um, actually Christmas, around Christmas time a few years back, um, I was playing one of the, the FIFA games, a FIFA Ultimate Team. For those that have ever played those, they're very familiar with what, what I'm referring to. And it's essentially a um, you know multiplayer game in which you, obviously you're, you're playing soccer, but the fun aspect isn't even the playing soccer part, it's assembling your ultimate team. But how do you assemble your ultimate team? You have to buy packs. Yep. And each pack, there's different levels of pack, and they cost more. They either cost... You know, they, they toss these credits, or you can buy them with real money. Mm-hmm. And if you want to buy, you want to attain credits, you can get those credits by playing lots of games. But it takes a really long time to to get enough credits to yeah. buy the good ones. Or you can just spend a little bit of money, and mm-hmm. you can get actually quite a bit. Yeah. And so f- there was a period where you know I spent a couple hundred bucks just buying packs, mm-hmm. and didn't even have the game open. By the way, I, I distinctly remember sitting on the couch during Christmas, you know, Christmas Eve with my with my family, and I had the app up on my phone, and I was flipping through. Okay, I'm going to buy this pack, open the pack, see what's there, because they, ha- they actually have an app where you can basically just do nothing but open packs and set your team. Hmm. You're not even going to play the game. You're not playing a match. You're just setting your team. And then I realized after a while that I had spent so much more time um, looking for packs, trying to find ways to get packs, and setting up my team structure than I had actually played the game. And that's kind of when I had that you know, kind of realization, this this is not really a productive use of time, and I'm not really getting my money's worth because I'm not really even playing the game at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of steer clear of that now, but I can see why. And I, I was probably not even anywhere near the whales that they go after either. There's oh, people no. that spend thousands of dollars on yes, those yes. regularly, each and each yearly edition. On too. their credit card, no less, which is terrifying. Yes. So I do think that there is something there, and I think that there, something needs to be done. The only problem is... Um, the gaming industry had been self-regulating for so long, and that's that's kind of where the ESRB came from. Was the the game industry itself se- regulating themselves? It, that's not a government entity. Yeah. That is the the industry itself trying to avoid government regulation. And by you know with EA and 2K and Activision kind of pushing things so far with uh, microtransactions and loot boxes. We might be at a point where there is going to be government regulation. They may have stepped a little bit too far, and that could have some long-reaching effects, not just when it comes to loot boxes or microtransactions, but possibly a lot more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's it's one of those things where I think that there's a healthy amount of uh, regulation, whether it's self-regulation or government regulation. Right. But there's definitely that concern over the sort of the slippery slope of like fuzzy definitions and stuff like that that can actually really <laughs> severely impact oh, yeah. our freedom to be able to make things certain ways or mm-hmm. whatever. And even if it's something that like everyone would agree, oh yeah, no, this is totally fine. What what happens when just trying to put a feature into a game that makes it attractive to purchase full price, no microtransactions? Yeah. What when when does that become a predatory practice, that sort of thing. Yeah, um, yeah. It could start getting into possibly freedom of speech issues and that sort of stuff. So mm-hmm. um, it'll be interesting to see how this goes. Hopefully, like like I said, I'm totally cool with a certain degree of regulation oh, yeah. as long as it's kept in check. But it's long, mm-hmm. it, if it starts to get out of control, it can become problematic. Well, once you open that Pandora's box, I mean, you can't close it again. Exactly. So this, this could be... We could see games change quite a bit this time next year. Yeah. We could see a lot yeah. of changes. It'll be interesting to see where this goes. This is Backtalk, where someone shares new thoughts on a previous discussion. One more sort of quick note, uh, following up on what we talked about last week with uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2 and loot boxes and all that sort of fun stuff. Um, at one point during the discussion, we brought up the cost of making games at some of these bigger publishers and stuff like that. And completely free. So Jim, you shared a video uh, during that discussion from a, a YouTube channel called Tarmac. There was a show called Feature Creep, and they talked about um, the, the, basically the argument that they made throughout the episode, and they backed up with some stats and stuff like that, was that games aren't too expensive to make. And so um, I had a few thoughts on this that I went ahead and wrote down just because uh, I'm really terrible at remembering all these points <laughs> on the fly. Uh, so if it sounds like this is scripted, it's because it is. As I was listening to it, it sounded to me like the blockbuster model, um, which is something that I might have mentioned on the show before. It's something that we might talk about more in depth at some point. Basically, the idea that you um, spend more money on a fewer big projects rather than trying to spread it out over across a, uh, over across a lot of smaller projects you don't expect to do quite as well. It's basically putting your eggs into fewer, bigger baskets in the hopes that those bigger hits are going to be what sustains your business. Um, and so this might actually end up meaning uh, spending less money overall and making more profit, um, which is actually a no-brainer for a business uh, when, your pro- when profit is your objective. 
this video is a direct counter to the argument that microtransactions are necessary to make games, uh, which is not an argument that I would make, certainly. Um, we've seen the games, even huge budget games can be made without microtransactions. Um, what he does say, and which I think is the point that I was fumbling to get at last episode, is that this results in a more stable, not just a sustainable business model with fewer peaks and valleys. And that's something that the stakeholders, to his point in the video, like to see. They like to see a consistent profit um, rather than panicking over when we have dips like you often have in the games industry. Um, so I would say that like, while we can lament that the subjective quality of games suffers when bigger publishers take a profit first approach, um, and we could even argue over whether prioritizing profit in that way equates to corporate greed, which is something that most people would probably say like, oh yeah, this corporation is being greedy when they want a profit, but that's why you do business is to make a profit. So that's a, that's a subjective thing. I would say it can be taken too far. Certainly while it's disappointing, it has and always will be utterly unsurprising to me. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that I don't feel particularly strongly about the sort of thing when news comes out about it. Um, a lot of people had this huge backlash to Star Wars Battlefront 2, and I just sort of took it as like, eh, it's EA. <laughs> um, just because it is an unsurprising phenomenon at this point. And that's basically the argument I was trying to make um, last episode that I didn't quite get around to. I would also say that just, you know, even if we accept that this model is okay, I just thought it was interesting um, before they had the backlash and they shut down microtransactions that they... Um, made it cost so much to get anything, really, uh, that when people do spend money on something, you know, to your point, Jim, when you were saying that you'd buy a pack in FIFA and actually have like a pretty substantial um, thing to kind of like reward you for spending that money. Yeah, they would always have at least, um, they would have a guarantee, like each pack level. Mm -hmm. Like if you bought a gold pack, you would always have at least one rare or something like right, that. Right, yeah. May not be the rare you want. In mm -hmm. fact, it probably wasn't. Yeah. But at least it was a rare someone might want, and then mm -hmm. you could try to sell it to somebody else and mm -hmm. get credits to buy other packs. Exactly. And so I think that in that case, you know, it, it's still arguably not the greatest practice, but at least it feels rewarding to someone who's engaging in it. Um, with Star Wars, to me, it felt like um, unless you spend a ton of money up front, and you wouldn't necessarily do this, you would buy like maybe say the five dollar pack just to see what it gets you. You would find they get you nothing, and people wouldn't even <laughs> find it find it worthwhile spending that money. And so I think that the business model wouldn't even work in this case, just because people don't find it worth their while. Mm -hmm. Grab your salt shakers, because it's time for some reckless speculation. Arcs used to engage with rumors, hearsay, and all sorts of crazy theories. We're just going to talk some about The Last Jedi because it's coming. Um, I'm sure we're all going to see it as Star Wars fans, even even though I know I was disappointed in, in, in The Force Awakens. I thought it had some moments that were good, but overall it was um, – it's hard to live up to Star Wars – just to the expectation of Star Wars, obviously. But um, I didn't think it quite hit that mark. Uh, but I'm a little excited for Last Jedi in spite of myself, and part of that is because of a couple of things. One, um, Luke Skywalker is back. Yeah. And, I, you know, that's great because – I'm a huge Luke Skywalker fan, but not just that. Um, we have a different director this time around, mm -hmm. and we have a different writer. And the director and, actually yes. um, has been known or is known for some stuff that I actually really liked. It's um, Rian Johnson. Uh, what I kind of know him for personally is he directed um, probably more than just a couple episodes of Breaking Bad, but the ones that I know of right. are some of like the yeah. best episodes in the show. Yes. Um, and so that's kind of what got me excited too. And yeah. then, of course, also Brick. Mm hmm. Which is a, a, like was his like ma his first feature film, mm. but it got a lot of attention and it won an award at Sundance. Um, also, he directed. Uh, I did not see this one, The Brothers Bloom, and then Looper. Y'all might have seen Looper. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I watched Looper the other day. Yeah. So um, it's it. Honestly, I was more excited because I don't. I'm not a big. I, I do not like J.J. Abrams. I've. I'm not exactly um, shy to admit that. I just don't like his work. Um, and I kind of got out of TFA what I expected to get out of a J.J. Abrams movie, which was explosions and not much else. And uh, <laughs> I'm hoping for some actual character development from um, The Last Jedi. So I am kind of excited about that because I felt like a lot of the characters just were very flat, especially Ray. The, the lead character was extremely flat. And I want to see actual development. And development doesn't mean... Um, oh, I, I, I touched the, the control panel of the um, Millennium Falcon for the first time, and suddenly I'm a better pilot than Han Solo. That's not character development. That's bullshit. What I want to see is actual character development, not getting powers for no reason. So it, she's going to be training in this one, which suggests struggle, which suggests development. So we'll see. I don't know. I mean, I don't know where it's going to go, but I kind of want to see what 
what y'all think, you so, know, some, to, some to speculation. Be fair, Jim, now we have four movies in the Star Wars canon where the main characters were completely wooden and couldn't act. So I, I consider that to be the majority now. Just, just throwing <laughs> that out there. I, I can't argue with you. Yeah. I mean, I mean the first the first two Star Wars films for me are by far the best. Excellent movies. Um, I think I th- I've always thought Jedi was a little bit of a dip because it felt like it moved a little farther into the marketing territory. But it was still a good film. I still enjoyed it, and it still had some powerful moments. And honestly, that was it for me. I mean, I liked Rogue One. Mm-hmm. It was the closest that it came to having that old Star Wars feel for me was Rogue One. Still, otherwise, that's it for 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 the films. I still had a lot of great experiences with some of the books, some of the mm-hmm. comics, some of the video games. Um, but the films have have really been... At this point, there's been more bad films than good films. Yep. So what they did with uh, the Force Awakens that I kind of went, oh, okay, was they did one of the soft reboots that are yeah. all the rage. JJ's very good at those. Um, well, and, good, good in quotation marks. Yeah, good, in, good in quotation marks. Yeah. Um, it's kind of it's part, part of his repertoire. Yeah. And so – when I walked out of there the first time, I went, oh, wow, it's so amazing. Blah, blah, blah. And then, the, then the, the explosions wore off. I went back and saw it a second time, got a chance to really sit down, kind of look at it and see the scene that I missed when I went to the bathroom and be like, oh, okay, um, yeah, I get it now. This is a reboot on, on the whole thing. I am so tired of a planet-sized thing that blows up planets. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> it, sick of it. It's I'm a, just it, tired of it. It wasn't, it wasn't even just the overall story. It was a beat for, like beat for beat. Yeah, it was. T- took from A New Hope. But not only did it take beat for beat, it actually killed the pacing. Because yeah. the original Star Wars film was one of the – it's like an excellently paced movie. Yeah. And that's one of its biggest strengths oh, was the save pacing. It, save it for the meaty topic, Jim, yeah. because <laughs> that I think was entirely on purpose. But, you know, the question then arises – how do we do that without being derivative? You do something different. Yeah. You didn't have to do the same story, the same story, and then then also beat for beat from the original, and didn't didn't keep the pacing. So the pacing was shit. It was just I had a lot of problems with the way the movie was made, and more so more so the way the movie was made than even the story or the characters. Mm-hmm. You know. It, so here's the thing I fear the most about the whole trajectory of where this thing. Aside is going. from the dark side. Well, actually, that, that is what I fear Oh, most. uh-oh. <laughs> um, I, I really do think that they're going to tell the redemption story of Kylo Ren. Which I think is, is worth telling. Maybe. The problem is this. If you're planning to tell the redemption story of Kylo Ren from the very beginning, then you're going to give clues and, and read into that from, from the very beginning. It's little subtle things. Like um, whenever he gets mad, he doesn't kill his lieutenants. He rages... <laughs> on uh, technology, uh, you know, on, on a console, mm-hmm. little stuff like that. Um, and so whenever you have this moment, this terrifying moment, he wants to be really creepy. What does he do? He takes off his mask and looks at his uh, probably cousin and says, uh, you know, the thing that he says, and suddenly he's more human. And so you've got these moments where I, I think what I'm worried about is that they're going to get so lost in that that they're going to forget about the idea of good and evil, and they're going to do a postmodern thing, which is there's no such thing as good or evil. Good is really evil if it's done uh, evilly, and evil's really good if it's done with good intentions, and you're going to end up with this grayness that is a complete wash of there being an objective mm. good. That that has been something that's, you know, I've heard some, read some speculation about that as well and had a similar thought when it comes to Luke Skywalker's character, because there's been talk that... Um, he he might be gr- a gray Jedi, gray Jedi yeah. um, sort of using both the light and the dark side of the Force. I don't think that's going to like happen. Qui Gon Jinn. Well, but but Qui Gon wasn't really a gray Jedi. You oh, know, yeah. they, they had oh, said yeah. that, but he wasn't. That was that was like some fan. Don't, theory. don't mess with my hand, head cannon. <laughs> but he really, but he didn't use the dark side of the force. That's right. He didn't. So he he may have been you know an out, kind of an outcast from the Jedi Order. Yeah. A little bit of a renegade. Yeah, a, definitely a renegade. But he wasn't using the dark side. Right. Whereas the the gray Jedi use both the light and the dark side. Yeah, yeah. You know, in equal measure is kind of their thing. Yep. So I don't think they're going to go that way because I don't think Disney wants to go that direction. So a little bit of speculation then on the title. Sure. Um, I, I think that what... Well, is the, will this be The Last Jedi? I think yes, in, in one sense. Um, in the broad sense of uh, there being space monks with magical powers, hmm. no. But I think in the sense of the Jedi Order itself, yes. I think Luke will be the last Jedi to lay claim to the title of 
Jedi. And I think where they're going with it is hmm. that there's going to be a new order and they're going to be called something else. Um, but they're not the going to use way. the word Jedi? Probably That's not. an extremely marketable term. You really think that Disney's going to I give up on that? I don't think so. I don't know. Uh, and, but what, where I'm going with it is, uh, you know, you've got this whole new order, hmm. uh, pun intended, of, <laughs> of stormtroopers, but they're not Imperials, right? Sure. You've got You've got Kylo Ren, who is a Sith, but he's not a Sith. You know what I'm saying? Well, I, from I'm, what I've gathered, the First Order actually is kind of the Imperial Remnant. Just it is the Imperial they Remnant, are. yeah. But it's not the Imperials. Mm. That's they're, the point. But they're still called Stormtroopers. Yes, they are. And just so I, I think that there are certain certain words, certain certain terms that are part of Star Wars lore, mm-hmm. and it's act, and that's part of what. Disney bought when they spent like a bill a billion trillion dollars for Star Wars. <laughs> <Billion> trillion. Right. <laughs> so that's part of what they got. They got, for example, the Force. They got lightsabers. Yeah. They got um stormtroopers. Uh-huh. They got droids and they, they got, got Jedi. Jedi. And Jedi's a huge, huge there are, there's literally actual like like people that are so obsessed with Star Wars and so obsessed with the concept of a Jedi that that has become their religion. Yeah. And that's not an exaggeration. That's actually what it is. Yeah. So I just I would be more shocked at that than any other thing that they could possibly do in any of these movies would be that, would be to just basically kill off the whole term mm-hmm. Jedi. I just don't think it's going to happen. Okay. Only for only for the Marvel movies. I'm not saying, I don't disagree with you that it would that it would actually be a pretty interesting story. Mm-hmm. Like, it could be mm-hmm. really cool um, and be an interesting direction to go, and maybe the Jedi are played out. If there's no more Jedi Order, what is a Jedi? I get it. Right. But I, st- I think that term is just, it's too closely connected and i don't think disney has the faith in themselves or the people that they put in charge of these movies to come up with their own term that is that um i don't even know what the word i'm looking for it's, it could be that pervasive in well, pop culture i think it's going to be more way. more like um jedi are no longer a part of an order they are they are those who um, self-discover and there's no formal form of training and that kind of it's going to change. In oh. other words, and it, it's, you mean like you mean like Ray, where it was where it was uh, um yes. the matrix as opposed to Star Wars. Yes, I think you're going to be deeply, deeply disappointed in the so-called new order of Jedi that's going to appear because all of them are going to wake up one day and have magic powers and be fine. And it's going to speak to this Uh. generational idea of being anti-establishment, being anti-government, being anti-corporate, being anti-church. But not not just that. It's also speaking to the concept of, I don't have to work for anything. It's just going to happen. Entitled? Yes. I'm either, (laughs) either I'm special and I get everything that I want right away. Because that's what Ray. That's the part of, of Ray's story that I that really bugged me. Yeah, is it didn't feel like she had to work for anything. It yeah. just felt like every every time where she was in trouble or she needed to know something, she just knew it. Yeah, she just suddenly suddenly she she knew how to use the Jedi mind trick. But suddenly she knew how to pilot the Millennium Falcon. And I want to see characters struggle because that's interesting. But I also want to see characters that you know the, the respect for the training, the respect yeah, for yeah. like learning something new because that's how we as people are. Like you can't just wake up. I don't care who you are. M- you know, I don't Michael Jordan did not wake up, never touched a basketball, someone threw a basketball and suddenly he's the best player in the world. That didn't happen. Jim, am I hearing you say that you're about to take away Finn's participation trophy? Is that what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm hearing you say is that, that Finn is going to lose his participation trophy? <sighs> I, I I'm, I'm just – all I'm saying is that I hope that we're moving away from some of the things that J.J. did um, in the first film that made me worry that I may no longer like the, like Star Wars. Just I mean, remember, that's – Films are not made by a single person, despite what George Lucas made us believe. They are made by large, large teams of people, and those large teams are guided by – let's call them rudders, which are sure. those directors and, and that whatnot – I think, and I've said this before, and I will, I will state my thesis again, I think Star Wars has long since surpassed the ability of Engl- any single person to be able to steer it. I think we are now collectively in ownership of Star Wars, and it will be what we collectively choose for it to be. And a thousand years from now, I know this is crazy, but a thousand years from now, this will be the mythology that is taught in school of this era Hmm. Is is the this is one of the, the major stories, stories we the tell. epic yeah. stories that were told by this generation, and it will look back and it will analyze why it is that that was so important to us generationally, and, I and think, how it dies is going to be as significant as how it was born. I think to your point too, the the biggest problem that I kind of felt the Force Awakens had um, was that it had this really great list of items that made for a quote unquote epic story, um, but the 
execution getting from um, item A yeah. to item B to item C the connectedness was very, between them was very weak. I, I completely um, agree. Like with for that. example, like the the giant planet or the Star Killer base uh, takes out the core planets of the New Republic. We had no time to get to know the New Republic, so that was absolutely meaningless. It to was. Us. Yeah, <laughs> we had Does no time it, to get to know the characters, yeah. and the characters didn't have time to get to know each other. Yeah. like the whole thing just felt like you're jumping from mm. one action scene to another, which yeah. could be great if it's like if we had existing characters. Sure, or it could be great if have, I'm watching yeah. the freaking transporter, not yeah. Star Wars. And well, so when we the had, beam split, mm-hmm. I was like, "What?" Yeah, and so we had yeah. like we had like all the right archetypes, and we had all the right like you know story elements, but it just wasn't executed very yeah. well. Yeah, and that's why I'm. A J.J. Abrams movie. I mean, yes, that's right. that's what so, you're describing yeah, because that's yeah, what all yeah. of his movies are. And, all they, all and they that's needed why... to do was take out something mm-hmm. iconic, mm-hmm. like the Senate. Like if they'd blown up Coruscant, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, yeah, we all know Coruscant. We know everything about Coruscant. If if they had blown up the Senate on Coruscant, maybe they did. I don't even know. Mm-hmm. And then we'd cut to like uh, Senator Jar Jar going, "Oh no, sir!" <laughs> and then blow up, boom, everything fixed. Right? Sure. We're taken to that emotional space. The, the problem with that would be right? people would cheer. <laughs> when Jar Jar gets killed. Yeah, it's true. It's so true. I was okay, maybe those, not Jar Jar. I, I was thinking of those kids like a thousand years from now, they're in class and it's like the next day is a uh, Jar Jar Binks. Like they get to that point in, in their in their like studies of Star Wars. Uh-huh. Like, yeah, we're just gonna skip. We're just <laughs> skip class this day. But between that and the sort of joint ownership idea, Doc, that you mentioned yeah, is yeah, why yeah. I'm I don't think I'm worried about what you're worried about. Uh-huh. Um and I think that Actually, I'd find that direction of the story pretty interesting if it mm-hmm. was done well. Um, I'm totally open to them moving the series in a new direction or having a new tone or something like that. I'd love it if they did. I just don't think it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, because, to your point, you know, there, it's all about um, these iconic heroes and it's about yeah. the, the trademark terms and all this different stuff. Well, that was and, Jim's point, technically. Yeah, well, both of you. <laughs> I think collectively, this, this whole discussion. But, but, I, but I actually agree with what Doc is saying about the, well, how they're going to change the characters because that's what we saw in Force Awakens, yeah. where how do, how do you become a Jedi. Oh, uh, you're you're just the one. Yeah. And and the funny part was, Luke Luke was that way too. And mm-hmm. but they didn't. They still recognize that just because you have this potential doesn't mean you. Yeah, doesn't mean that you're just going to magically become the best. Well, at everything. we had two weeks of you, training, dude. <laughs> two weeks of training. Well, and on here's Dagobah. and here's here's kind of my thought on that is that um, everything about Ray being OP, uh, I think, kind of speaks to like. Again, this trope they've used throughout the series of like the person with the high potential who then is going to become great in some way. With I think this is actually following the Anakin story more than the Luke no, story. It, sure, where but they did it got... too quickly is the problem. Fair. And remember fair. the Anakin story. If you're referring, you're referring to the prequels. Mm-hmm. We're also a failure. Yeah. So they're they're but, taking the wrong. They're going after the wrong uh, model here. But I think that what they might be leading up to is that because everything is kind of given to her when she gets a hold of like true power and learns what she's capable of, then maybe she starts making some mistakes, and that might be what we're kind of getting hints at through the trailers and stuff. I, like I that. really hope that happens, and if it does, then Rian, jo- Rian Johnson will reignite my interest in Star Wars. That's because true. Because I, I feel like I've only seen power like that once before, and it didn't scare me then. <laughs> Still doesn't. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. So uh, I think the theme of this episode has actually kind of been uh, very related to our meaty topic, which uh, it's always nice when that happens. Uh, consumer expectations, uh, building expectations around uh, franchises or series, or maybe someone, uh, Jim, you had the example before of like someone pitches a game to you saying, oh, it's a lot like this game. If you like this game, you'll like this one. Uh, and then maybe that changing um, sort of the way you approach it. I would say that the our predisposition and whether or not we're aware that we have it is going to drastically affect the way that we experience any given media um, and might bias us one way or the other. Maybe if we go into something wanting to like it, we'll find more good in it than it really has. Or if we go into something disliking it, we might, uh, or wanting to dislike it, we might not see the good in it. it. Yeah, no, totally. And I don't think it's even just about like or dislike. I think it's about how you approach th- how you approach it and how you play the game is going to be different too. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, um, and I'll Talk more. I've talked some about Yakuza Kiwami. I'll talk some more about uh, the Yakuza series, specifically Yakuza Zero, next week. But um, when I had first heard of these games, I was looking for another open world game to kind of occupy my time. And I had heard that the Yakuza series, oh, it's it's kind of like GTA, but you know, in Japan with like gangs with like Japanese gangsters, Yakuza and stuff. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. I like. I really. I'm a huge GTA fan. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll check that out. And if I hadn't gone into it. Like it, it was a little bit of a shock at first. If I hadn't kind of 
powered through those first few chapters in Yakuza Kiwami, which was the first one I played of those two games, um, I probably wouldn't, I would certainly wouldn't have bought Zero, and I wouldn't have had a great experience that I did. Um, because they're not the same game. They're actually quite, it, that's a horrible comparison. Just <laughs> because you happen to play a criminal, and the game is open world, and you have various little um, mini quests that you could, like mini, mini quests is a bad term. You do have mini quests, like side stories and stuff. But you have little other activities you can do, like you can throw darts, and you can go to, you know, karaoke, or like an arcade or something. So yeah, sure, you can do that in Grand Theft Auto. But Grand Theft Auto is very much, it's, it's much more of an open experience. In Yakuza, there are a lot of, you know, cut, there's a lot of cuts, focus on cutscenes and story. And it's very much, it's much more comparable to, say, a Japanese crime drama film mm -hmm. with open world elements. I got the impression, and too, that even just weird, core, core gameplay was yes. like GTA is more shooter action, and this is more like a beat em up brawler sort. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a good comparison. It's much more beat em up. There, you have guns, but you don't really use them very much. Mm -hmm. And it's also much quirkier. Like, I know GTA is funny mm -hmm. it is but yakuza has this weird quirkiness it's almost like you know some of the anime quirkiness mm -hmm. style to it and just weirdness like absolute like weirdness that mm -hmm. if i wasn't into that sort of thing i would be completely turned off so um I'll, i think that's that's one example but i feel that if you if you pick up a game and someone tells you that that it's going to be a certain sort of game you might be tempted to play it with that in mind right. and you may not get the, the right you may not experience it the way that you could experience it. Mm -hmm. um, Near Automata, a game that I played earlier this year, when I first picked it up, I had no idea what to expect. Mm -hmm. But I had heard, oh, it's this really great action game. That's all I heard. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, it's kind of like Bayonetta was the one comparison mm -hmm. that I got. Yeah, basically, the, and it's not the, the premise that I was going off of. It was even so much something I was told. It was just that, like, oh, it's platinum and square right. enix and so it's an open world platinum brawler yeah um and it ended up being just a little bit different from my expectation based on just that right but it was it, like i didn't go into it this huge like oh it's going to be exactly like this and mm -hmm. it wasn't sort of deal yeah no but it it, it was one of, the, one of those things that kind of shocked me and the 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 role the way the role playing elements fit into the game but mm -hmm. not just that but what got me was the story mm -hmm. the storyline the the you know it's the sort of psychological focus of or the philosophical focus rather um of the game or you know, the way that the, the, the characters, I thought the characterization and the way that it was, you know, they were presented in the game and their growth uh, was actually pretty incredible for, for, it completely came out of left field for me. So I, I do think that um, it's, it's certainly, inter it's certainly a good thing when you, when you are getting, you're trying to figure out, okay, what game am I going to, am I going to play next? And you may not know what to compare it to. So I get why we get into these, you know, hey, it's kind of like this, it's kind of like that. But you can really ruin your experience. I mean, I've quit games before and come back to them months later mm -hmm. because when I first started playing them, a good example, um, Metal, Metal Gear Solid 3. Mm -hmm. That was the first Metal Gear Solid game that I played. And I picked it up because I, was, I had heard, um, oh yeah, it's a stealth game and I like Thief. Mm -hmm. I'm going to play it. Mm -hmm. Well, if you've played Thief and you've played Metal Gear Solid, <laughs> they're games. really very different. Yeah. And I actually couldn't play it i thought it was too hard i thought the controls were um just esoteric <laughs> and i couldn't get into it and i quit in the first level and i i and i said i hate metal gear solid and i put it away and then i came back to it i picked it up off my shelf like about probably about a year later and i put it in on a lark because i had a lot of time and i had a completely different mindset like mm -hmm. i'm just going to try this out and see what happens mm -hmm. and metal gear solid 3 became one of my favorite video games of all time interesting and the series i fell in love with it and i went back and i played every single game in the series so it's that that mindset i mean i think this speaks a little bit too and this again this can apply to any sort of media but i think games in particular um because we're a gaming show <laughs> yeah exactly. but i think games in particular have this specific kind of idea that i'm about to talk about hmm. which is that a game is about like learning about the game um, so you're going through and you're learning the systems, you're learning the mechanics, you're yeah. trying to master them. Mm -hmm. And you kind of have to come at that with an understanding of like, here's the feedback loop that I'm getting from the game. And if you have, and again, this is maybe a very extreme sort of example, but if you have kind of like, it's supposed to work like this game, then you might start missing cues that the game's giving you that like, no, that's not an effective that's strategy. That's a really that's great sort of connection. Yeah, that and is. it's not just about the mechanics also. I think mm -hmm. you would agree that it's also about the narratives and yeah. the whole package basically. Mm -hmm. So whenever you mention GTA, Jim, mm -hmm. what what I think of in my head very specifically is, yes, you have the, the free openness to go into at least part of the city, but you also have very specific 
um, linear style stories right, that right. are threaded. So you can follow one path and ignore the other one up to a point. Um, but usually there's three or four different stories going on at once. Um, also, you've got that that freedom to commit lots of different crimes, do lots of different mm-hmm. things. Um, and it, there's this sort of package that you get with the world. Like Vice City is my favorite. And um, what I love about the Vice City is more than just the 80s thing, but that you know that's part of it. That's a huge <laughs> part of it. Um, but it's the humor in, in Vice City. I right. think it it edges up against dirty yeah. um, and doesn't quite cross the line into completely obscene. And some of the newer games do that. And that's the reason I don't like uh, Five, for example, nearly as much is because it just it, it I I literally was like okay that's that, that's over the top that stopped being um satire yeah. and now it's 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 moved over into crime drama we, land we definitely I I will say that there is also why I don't like South Park yeah uh no I, just, I wouldn't really compare the the comedic style or tone of GTA 5 with South Park I think South no, Park either, is definitely it, m- much far much closer to like much farther away I but should they, say but they they both cross the line um, I, I think that we talked a little bit about this before the show started. I think that you, you, when you have some extra time and you feel like sitting down and giving the game another chance, kind of like how I did with, you know, Metal Gear Solid 3, maybe sit down and play. I'm you were going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe give, you know, GTA 5 more time because you said you only played about two hours, right? Yeah. And for a game with as much content as GTA 5, you could very easily have played the wrong two hours. It's possible. I mean, it's to, possible. You could give it a chance. And there's depth. I'm not, I am not going to say that there are not moments in that game that are, that, in a, in a sense, cross the line. Mm-hmm. But there are some of them that I feel like the fact that they did that, the fact that they, and I'm, I'm referring um, to use one specific example. There's a scene where you, I'm sure I've talked about this on the show before, where you torture someone, you have to torture yeah, someone, yeah. and it is disturbing, and you don't want to do it, and yet you have to do I, it. I'm familiar with that scene. And it, it's interesting, because about the same but you, time... But you didn't play that scene. I didn't, I didn't play that scene, but I've heard enough people describe yeah. playing that scene that it was, that it was disturbing, that it's not it's something I want to engage in. Literally, the idea of being led to that is going gonna, is gonna to taint or color or ruin some of the other play experience for me. I, I actually, in my head, because this is a game I, I did play, uh, what's, what's the one where you're in Chicago, but you have, you have access to the entire internet and you can shut down all the, the lights Watch and Dogs. Watch, Watch Dogs. Dogs. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, do you remember the beginning of Watch Dogs? Back in an early, early episode of the podcast, I think it was, I want to say it was Richard, mm-hmm. talked about that It was moment Richard, yes. Where, where you have to shoot the guy. You have to yes. shoot the guy and you can't not shoot the guy. Yeah. I had the exact same experience as him. And so... That to me, they, they have that, and it, they have a lot of moments like that. And with a torture one, you you have to do it because of the situation that you're in. Mm-hmm. There's this other part where you have to snipe. Um, it's part of that same quest line. Yeah. You have to snipe this guy who's supposed to. You know, you're told that he's done this. You know, bad yeah. stuff, and you can shoot anyone, and they just assume they just they yeah. just kind of move on. So, did you shoot the right guy? Uh, yeah, it's this weird experience That's where it's so. I think it's worth playing, not just for moments like that, but because I do feel that that Rockstar, when it comes to satire, um, is pretty much at the top of, of mm-hmm, their game, mm-hmm. just in the game games industry at satire. And that's another thing that I would say differentiates Yakuza from um, GTA, because GTA is satire. And yes, sure, sometimes they can get kind of lewd, but they're, they're, they're satire. Yeah. Yakuza is weird, weird and wacky. They're not satire. They okay. have plenty of comedy, but they have weird and wacky contrasted with very serious and actually quite well written crime drama. This weird, like just the 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 contrast there is just so strange. It sounds Whereas, very Asian, actually. It is, it is, of course, because it's it's made by Sega. Yeah. Um you know, it's a Japanese game. But with GTA, the satire is is blended into the into the whole experience. Uh-huh. It's part of the story, and everything builds off of it, and everything works together and has this synergy that is uh, that's very difficult to pull off. Yeah, but it's, but that also makes for a very different experience. Um, but <laughs> made kinda, by the British, <laughs> right? Right by the British, but uh, which also makes a lot of sense yeah, for their culture. But about it, yeah. uh, I I would say that f- even if you may not like a, a few of the the missions, part of the part of GTA, it's always been okay. I don't like this mission there's going to be like 15 more that I like. Mm-hmm. So I certainly would say, if, if, especially for a game this huge, that has that is, by the way, still a top 10 seller. Like every month, it's just a top 10 seller. New game, not even, not even the, the, the DLC. So if you've only played two hours and we're a gaming podcast and we talk about games all the time, it's, all, it's almost a disservice. Like you got to at least play oh, like... Oh man, I used to tell it to my students. You, I know, but you got <laughs> to play at least like, you know, 
10, 15, something like that. Right, because I'll make you, I'll make it's a 100-hour game. I'll make you a deal, yeah. Jim. Loan it to me, and I will. Uh, I don't know. Do you have a... I only bought the Xbox 360 version, though. I've never rebought another I, system. Buy it for me, and I will. <laughs> I, I might have GTA Five on PS4. I'll, I'll check. With okay. You. Yeah. yeah, I definitely have it on Xbox, and I've actually, I've actually fought with myself on purchasing it again. I, I've really, yeah, wow. I've consistently been like, I really want to play a game like GTA. It's actually what led me to Yakuza. I'm mm-hmm. like, I really want to play a game like GTA. Oh, I, I don't want to buy it again. Buy it again. Yeah. I, I feel like yeah. I shouldn't do that. So then I, I stop and I look for another gaming experience, or I, I reinstall, reset up my Xbox and yeah. play it on yeah. there. So. But I've wanted to many times. Okay, so clearly a lot of passion about this I've played game. the game many times. And, and the topic <laughs> at hand that we're really discussing here is near misses, if you will. One-offs, sure. if you will, sure. right? So let's kind of staple that down sure. to the floor and see if we can circle it a little bit, come off of it. And what I, what well, I want to ask is what, what is it that makes a game like GTA or whatever the franchise we want to talk about is itself that something else can – copy and yet still miss. So this brings me to something that um, both of kind of like the elevator pitch of it's like this, but uh-huh. um, I've, I've talked before. The innovative part. Yeah. The innovative part, the kind of the creative element of trying to come up with this new content. And this is actually something that I mentioned a while back, a book called um, hit makers. And one thing that they talk about there, and this is actually in a few of the other books I read around that same time, they kind of hit on this idea in their own way. Um, of there being kind of a strategy to making something new, um, but that is also familiar. Uh, and so I think that, and this is, they were talking, I think, a lot about the the movie industry specifically here. But there's apparently a little bit of kind of a formula of um, you take two different ideas, you put them together, and then you kind of come up with one new thing. Um, or sometimes the new thing is actually just kind of the combination of those two different ideas. But the, the point being that you're supposed to have um, a lot of stuff that's familiar about it to kind of keep people if, – if something is too alien, they'll kind of get shut down really quickly. Um, and I think that what we tend to have is that there are some people uh, when they're making something that it was, comes across as quote-unquote original, it's just the expert execution of this combining of old ideas. Um, whereas the things that tend to fail that seem derivative are the ones that combine a couple of different ideas but don't do it well. Mm. Um, and so I think that those kind of near misses is like, hey, we're going to make – we're going to make a GTA, but it's going to be set in Hong Kong. And we're going to have some more Kung Fu elements, Sleeping Dogs. Yeah, but yeah. Sleeping Dogs wasn't a miss. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It I'm was saying, actually I'm a really, it was example. actually, I mean, it's, if I'm, if I, if I class it in with GTA, I'm mm-hmm. like, it's, it's actually, it works. Yeah. Now it has differences. Definitely. Yeah. 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 And that, that's what I'm saying is that like, that's an example of a hit where you took like, we're going to make a GTA, but with, yeah. and then that, but with is the sort of original thing that made it its own. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas you have a lot of these and especially, um, a few years back when like kind of the indie scene was like having this big surge and everyone and their grandmother was making indie games. Um, you had a lot of like these sort of, Hey, we're going to do like this retro, like we're going to have like 2d sprite graphics and it's going to be a platformer that we do really terrible game feel right. with and that sort of thing. Or all of the Zelda copies mm-hmm. and Zelda legend of Zelda has had tons of games that are basically trying to emulate legend of Zelda. Some of them have been successful. Many of them have been failures. Mm-hmm. Um, Actually, Legend of Zelda is a great one to talk about. I mean, it recently had um, a game that that did differentiate itself um, and do a lot of new things from the rest of the series, Breath of the Wild, mm-hmm. but was very successful at it. And yet it's coming off of a game that was in, arguably very similar to other Zelda games. I'm referring to Skyward Sword, yep. uh, very similar to other 3D Zelda games, at least in terms of um, execution and, and, and gameplay. And it was a failure. I mean, I didn't like Skyward Sword. And I'm a huge Zelda fan. I never played it. Because I thought Skyward Sword was... You know, in terms of the mainline Zelda games, the worst one. It just wasn't. It just wasn't. There's a lot of problems I have with it, and it's even hard for me to talk about what some of those were. And what's but, interesting is it actually did certain things really well. Um, we've sure. Also yeah, before, some things um, it did well. Mark Brown's series on YouTube, uh, Boss Keys. Yeah. He actually was talking about the dungeons in Skyward Sword, and he actually was talking about how, like, these are some of the best dungeons in the series because they take a lot of these ideas that other ones start to miss. A lot of dungeons started to become very linear. You didn't really have to have a very strong, like, understanding of the space. I'm going to have to mm-hmm. disagree with him strongly on that one. I thought the dungeons were actually <laughs> well, pretty weak. Well, and I think if you if you were to, I don't know if you've been following like, Boss like Keys. Like, twi- Twilight, Twilight Princess, for example, which I actually thought was 
pretty underrated. Mm-hmm. I think it's getting more attention now. Mm-hmm. Had much better dungeons. I would say, and maybe maybe I might be misremembering his video a little, but I think there were at least certain dungeons. There might have been a really few. Liked. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say the whole game was so bad. Yeah. I just think that a lot of, I think part of it was the flying element. Mm-hmm. Um, the the overall villain I don't think was handled very well mm-hmm. the way that was set up um, oh, yeah. with, yeah, with was, Ganon. I mean, it was just weird. It, it was there was a lot that wasn't super great about it. But I think that was why that, I think that encouraged them to go in in a new direction, but an old direction mm-hmm. with Breath of the Wild, where they basically went back to the roots of the original game, and they've talked about it before. Mm-hmm. You know, to kind of go what you know what makes a franchise, what makes a series, what are those elements, yeah. mm-hmm. and. They actually sat down, you know, Miyamoto, I, I, I'm going to butcher his name, Aonuma, is that the guy? Aonuma, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm so sorry for any Japanese speakers. I am not <laughs> Japanese. Um, so, but but they sat down and along, and along with the rest of the, you know, developing te- development team, and they talked, you know, they wrote down, okay, here are the elements that we feel like these are things that Legend of Zelda has, and these are some other things that we could possibly do, and like, what things can we cut? What things can we change? What things do we have to keep? Because this is, mm-hmm. this is Legend of Zelda. And they right. had this... You know, there was there was a there was you know heated conversations and, and arguments and st- kind of like what we have. You know, we're like, no, we have to have this because that's Legend of Zelda. And I was like, no, we don't need that because you know we have these other parts of it. And as someone who's played the game since the very very beginning, the very first game on the NES, um, Breath of the Wild, it evoked the same feelings from me I agree. as I had when I played the first game on the NES. Yep. And when I when I think back and try to think, okay, what other Legend of Zelda games have done that? evoke that same feeling i have a hard time naming them yeah because even though there were still good games like i ocarina of time you know great game wind waker uh you know twilight princess you know these these are games that i really liked or like you know say a link to the past to go back to the 2d ones or link's awakening sure really strong great games Mm -hmm. but they didn't really evoke the same feeling as the original game yes i agree um and so but breath of the wild did and why you know it's that you you feel under equipped at first, and you're 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 you have this exploration. You wake up in your underwear. Yeah, you wake up with, with nothing. Stick. With like just like in the original, you you wake up and you immediately you know go into the first cave, and you're just given like a wooden sword, which is basically a stick. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're given nothing, and then you're you're in this space. Hey, where do I go? No one tells you where to go. No one gives yeah. you anything. Yeah. It's not like a link to the past. If you just try to pop that game in and play it, which I have recently. You are directly told you got to go to the castle. You have this little dream. You wake yeah, up. Yeah. You have to go all through here. You got to do all this stuff. You're guided. It's, very it's a linear. very guided experience. Very linear. And that's what Zelda had become because they were basing it off of Link to the Past. And then when Ocarina of Time came out, they were basing it off of that. And it's yep. a very guided experience. Breath of the Wild is completely open, like the original game. Mm-hmm. And they they spent a lot of time trying to figure out what elements can we can we keep to make it still feel this is still Zelda and yet innovative. So. They pulled it off, but I mean, I mean, are there any even any other examples of games that have done that, and still, I, I can't even think of any to be honest with you. If we're actually going to that to that level of change and yet not change, sure, yeah, like like well, Metroid to Metroid Prime, they're basically different games. Let me ask you a, a quick question about an example you just brought up, which was Sleeping Dogs. Yeah. Okay, uh, how do you feel about the True Crime series? Not really a fan. Okay, because Sleeping Dogs was originally. A true crime sequel. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. And and so what happened was um, that in 2008, uh, it was, it sort of began, it was announced in 2009 as part of True Crime's series, but was canceled by Activision Blizzard in uh, 2011. And there were, that was a whole long roundabout thing that happened, but basically what happened is uh, Square Enix bought it, renamed it Sleeping Dogs didn't have the true crime license and uh, considers it a spiritual successor, let's yeah. say. So in that, let's call it resurrection, you, what, you're, what I'm hearing you say is they actually succeeded in doing something that the true crime series never succeeded in yeah. doing. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's, I know there's true, true crime series definitely has its fans, mm-hmm. but... Um, you know, Sleeping Dogs is actually pretty highly regarded. It's not just me saying that. I mean, it's. I think there's way too much profanity in it. There is a lot of profanity. Uh, even more so than uh, than the GT, the old GTAs that I enjoyed. Sure, but not as much as South Park. Right, and I, I don't like South Park. <laughs> but, just, but I'm kidding. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, the, I guess where I'm going with all of that is that whenever you talk about tone, and, I, and this is something Chris just said, I think that's an incredibly important part of what we're talking about. You said it uh, that Zelda evoked the emotions uh, or the feeling right. of the original, right? I think that that's got to be nailed or else you're not going to succeed in a successor hmm. 
And let's call it a spiritual successor right. and I, uh, of, of a franchise. So let's say I want to go make an Assassin's Creed. Yeah. Uh, highly successful franchise. You either hate it or, or love it. There's really not any in between there. Uh, they've just recently brought out Origins. I can't speak to it because I haven't played it because I don't care. Why don't I care? Because I haven't played a uh, Assassin's Creed game on the year it came out in like five, six years. I always play them a year later and I enjoy them a year later, but I am not a fanatical fan, right? So if if you were going to make something like that, what element would you need to, to quote to Tim Schafer, steal, but steal right? And I think the answer would be you'd need some of the stealth elements, you'd need some of the, the open world elements, you'd probably need some rooftop type elements, but I think you could get away with with a lot more of broad thinking and it still feel like an Assassin's Creed game without needing some kind of thing. Like maybe you'd need the the blend of the the technology, the modern technology and the and sort of the ancient world or something like that. But I don't know. Um so I think this is an interesting question whenever you want to emulate or imitate, because I would actually argue, this is a crazy idea mm. here, but I would actually argue that the closest game to Assassin's Creed that we've had come out recently that was not Assassin's Creed was Horizon Zero Dawn. Yeah, no, I, I totally understand what you're saying. And, I haven't even played the game, and I understand what you're saying. And there's no buildings yeah. to jump around on. Right. So that rooftop jumping stuff, the, the free running... Not even an yeah. element. But what you've got is an athletic pro, uh, athletic protagonist who is in a world of blended technology and what seems like ancient technology, right? Uh, there's a, a process of discovering a mystery, solving a mystery, uh, saving the world in the process. And um, it's a journey of self-discovery too. And in that sense, I think, I think that they are spiritually related, shall we say. Sure. And, and I do want to mention just um, briefly, because I kind of threw out Metroid and Metroid Prime there earlier. And actually on reflection, even though in terms of mechanically the games were, I think, very different mm -hmm. between Metroid and then the, when they when the switched over to Metroid Prime, uh, because they went to first person, it was very different. But in terms of tone, at least the original Metroid Prime did evoke a very similar feeling as Metroid for me. So I... I don't. I do think that that was another successful example of translating. Although it didn't, it wasn't the same way. It, I don't think it was the same level of success as Breath of the Wild because Breath of the Wild, it felt like okay, this is the Legend of Zelda. Whereas yeah. you know, you know, kind of yeah. what I'm saying. Whereas with with Metroid Prime, it's like okay, this is this is the first person shooter slash first person adventure version of Metroid. Yeah, yeah, that so, felt the same way. Even though I do feel like it felt like Metroid. You know, you yeah, had it had yeah. the right sounds, it had the right moments, that kind of thing. Breath of the Wild was also evocative. It was very clearly a post-apocalyptic um, Hyrule, mm -hmm. and it was like I've been in this place before, but it feels wrong, yeah. but it feels right. You know what I mean? And, and weirdly and that enough, was, that was beautiful, right? And weirdly enough, the I mean, if you go back and you actually examine things in the very first, you know, in, in the original Legend of Zelda, it was post-apocalyptic in a sense. In too. a way, yeah. I mean, it really yeah. was. Well, you, you, it actually they took elements from all the games, yeah. and and pop them in um like uh just just various almost shot for shot uh images but uh, okay so this seems like a really good point to to bring up that stargate principle i was talking about and again this is a this is a term that means nothing to anyone but me but i will explain it so it means something to you simply this back whenever i was in high school a movie came out called stargate mm. And my friends, my high school buddies, uh, I might have actually just barely been in college, but um, they, my, they were still my high school buddies. And they took me to see this film. They're like, it's, it's called Stargate. I think you'll like it. And I'm like, what's it about? They're like, ah, uh, the military, they find this ring, there's aliens. I don't know. Y you'll like it. So I went in literally knowing nothing. And I loved Loved, loved, loved that film. I loved the franchise. I loved the series, SG-1, that came out later. I loved all three series. Uh, you know, I loved the spinoff stuff. I consumed it for the longest time. Even back, and this is going to this, <laughs> this is gonna blow your mind if you're young. Um, there was a time when we couldn't watch TV again. If it didn't exist on DVD, uh, and, and there was no way to rewatch it. And that one of the very first shows to come out was Stargate 
on DVD. And I had the whole collection of all the series. I had the big box sets, right? Um, and so I would save money so that I could go buy each season when they finally came out over the course of the long years. Uh, and that was somewhere in the neighborhood of 2003, 2004 that all that was happening. Um, so to me, as I look back on it and I recognize and I try to rewatch it, it hasn't aged well. It's actually really cheesy. It's it's actually kind of bad. Yeah. I, I, I will admit, Stargate's kind of bad. But the film is still in, still interesting. Well, the film is I unto think. itself interesting. But my point is simply this. I loved it, and I gained great joy out of all of that because one very simple thing, I had no expectations going in. It was unlike anything I had seen before, and it, although now it's kind of tropey, it actually helped to develop a lot of those um, memes and tropes and, and mm -hmm. stylized elements. And even all the way down to some of the, like, like what we think of as military sci-fi. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I'm with you. I feel the same way about um, a couple of series. I don't know if, if y'all have watched them. I'm sure you're familiar. Um, Hercules, the legendary journeys and Xena warrior oh, princess. Yes. yes. Um, I, I was Kevin Sorbo for the win. Yes, I was, and still am, um, one of the biggest fans of both of those shows, um, made by the same development development team. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was a Sam Raimi, um, venture. That's right. And, and they crossed over sometimes too. Yeah, yeah, between yeah. the shows, oh, of course. If Xena was introduced in Hercules, and they they had multiple crossovers yeah. between them. It was terribly anachronistic, though. Extremely, but that was the point. They yeah. played it for jokes. They, they played they, it for laughs. They, 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 they knew they they would never tried to hide the right. anachronisms. It was they, very much. They also met Jesus once. I mean, you know, it was it was. There were yeah, they had. Well, I think they did definitely had some weird timing elements. It, it wasn't Jesus. It was. Um, Abraham. Xena meets Abraham mm -hmm. at one point. Oh, but another time they meet uh, pregnant Mary. Oh, you're, yeah, you're yeah, right. So, you are right. Yeah. You are right. They, they, they just a little bit care. of a time. They, do some, they yeah. do some weird stuff where, yeah, and those are actually the only parts that bother me where they did these weird, like, one moment they meet one character, and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm going to this moment, and the next time they meet, like, Caesar, and you're like, wait, what? Yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> uh, and there's, obviously, there's, there's issues I have sometimes with the series, but um, I kind of have a similar feeling that you do, even though I actually, I still go back and watch the episodes sometimes. Uh -huh. I don't, I wouldn't go so far as to say I think they're bad now, Maybe part of that was because the, those shows, both of them, were intentionally campy. Yeah. Like they were always campy. They also didn't and they, age well, right? But they owned. The, but if you like camp, they owned it. That's true. Just just like the Batman sixty six show, it owned camp. <laughs> I mean, it's camp, and it, they didn't pretend like right. with Stargate. And I did watch some of it back. I never really was as into it as you, but even though it had comic relief, Stargate was not a campy show, not intentionally. You know, it was it had comic relief, but it was a serious science fiction mm -hmm, show. Mm -hmm. Um, Hercules and, and Xena, even though they had serious moments and episodes, they were not serious shows. Right. They were campy shows. And so I think it, when you have a show like that, even though both aged very poorly in terms of special effects, when it comes to the storylines, the way they present themselves, you can it, – it's like that suspension of disbelief. You can, you can kind of let it go more when they're playing it for laughs versus this is supposed to be serious. Right. Well, and, and there were there were lots of laughs in Stargate too, but I guess where I'm really going with all that with the so-called Stargate principle is simply this: whenever you have a preconceived notion of what a thing is supposed to be, either genre-wise or more more on the nose, franchise-wise, uh, you're going to be very critical about it. And if you go into it with absolutely no concept of what it is you're getting into, I think that there is a possibility of enjoying it more. And right. I think that that kind of speaks to, you know, what we talked about with Star Wars earlier. We now have these people who are so into Star Wars that they have, even if it's not really what it is, there's kind of this notion of what Star Wars is to them. Yes. Um, when they first saw it as a kid and that feeling that they got and trying to kind of like rekindle that feeling. If something doesn't manage to do it, it feels very, very disappointing. Yes. And yet you could take like, you know, I've heard, you know, say just like on Twitter, Facebook, other places like that. Um, and actually like really in, like, you know, kind of brings a little smile to my face hearing these kids talk about how amazed they were by Star Wars or by these characters that will criticize because like, oh, they were shallow or they were overpowered. Well, but it's like, but when you're a kid, you just get caught up in sure. the fantasy. But that's, you know? that's kind of the, I think that's kind of my criticism of Force Awakens was mm -hmm. that was their focus. And I think that's the same criticism that I have for a lot of, and what I felt in Return of the Jedi too. Um, you're getting to a point where, okay, now we're marketing to kids. Mm -hmm. Is that feeling? And with TFA, definitely now we're marketing to kids. And so, and I, I felt that too when I when I went to see my you know my nephew for Thanksgiving recently, and he's he's huge into Star 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 Wars, and he's seen kind of seen the movies. He's not quite old enough yet to to sit down and watch two two and a half hour movie 
all together, but he's seen parts of the movies and he's watched a lot of TV shows and things like that. Star Wars is a franchise for kids now. It really is. But originally, it wasn't. It was a franchise for adults that kids liked. And there's, there's a I really... No, no, no. Yes, it is. I'll show you plenty of pictures of Empire Strikes Back right after the first film. All adults, like young adults, I'm not saying like 50-year-olds, but 18, 19, like college-age people, that was the Star Wars audience. And if you go back and you watch the first Star Wars film, or Empire, or Empire Strikes Back in particular, and you compare them to the tone of Force Awakens, it's very clear. Or, hell, um, Phantom Menace. You know, I'm not saying it started with Force Awakens, not at all. I mean, it started with Return of the Jedi. I'm flatly calling out one of the original trilogy mm-hmm. I would, when I, would, I say that's where it started. But, but it, it was cemented with the prequels. The prequels cemented it. Because who was the star of Phantom Menace? I, I would, who was the star of Phantom Menace? Who was the star of Phantom yes. Menace? Uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, clearly. The focus of the film, the kid, Anakin, a nine-year-old kid. That's who they chose as the star. Yeah. So, so then, therefore, who was it really marketed? And who, the comic relief, Jar Jar Banks. You know, you think about it, it's right. marketed to children. Force Awakens, even though, thankfully, they use more adult characters, and yes, they're still trying to appeal to adults. I'm not saying they're, like, ignoring adults, but it's definitely more of targeted to younger people. So that's why you have, like, you know, kids that enjoy it. That's great. I'm glad they enjoy it. I'm glad my nephew loves it. That's great. But... It also means it's not it's it's all it's not really for me anymore. Maybe I mean I'll see with the Last Jedi, mm-hmm. and that's it's just kind of my last my that, last hurrah. To be kind honest of my with point. you, and thank you, go- Mr. Plinkett. Yeah. And this this goes back to to uh, an episode we did a while back about the aging of audiences, and you weren't with us for that one, unfortunately, Jim. But um, I was I, too busy aging, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think that there really is kind of there's a point that we come to where sometimes we're disappointed when we realize that like oh. Yeah, this isn't for me. It was it was for me when I was the age that it was for me. But, well, but it's not for me anymore. I, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. Yeah. I, I get it. I just mean I'm I'm pi- I'm picking on Star Wars a little bit because I do feel like not only does it have that factor that you mentioned, and you you are correct. That is that is also true. But also it did shift in terms of its its initial target audience when um, George Lucas originally made made the first Star Wars film. He wasn't thinking, I'm going to sell a lot of toys and market this to eight-year-olds. That is not what he was thinking. But 108 episodes of Marvel Comics disagree with you, Jim. Sure. No, no. <laughs> I, it, it, it morphed to that is what I'm saying. So he wasn't— After in, the first film. It started to, but you cannot tell me that Empire Strikes Back was for children. I, I will say this. So that's, that, that's, my, let that's me, what let I'm answer, saying. Let me answer. In, in that era— it was not expected that the children would um, go see the film, but there was a burgeoning understanding of transmedia and oh, marketing of so that the toys were created. Sure. The comics were created. Cartoons were created. Yep. I mean, there was actually well, a whole, whole you, series called Droids. Sure. And there was also a whole, a whole cartoon series I watched it every morning called Rambo. That, yeah, exactly. Rambo was not for kids. Uh, no, <laughs> but it was the, not. But the TV series and the toys and the marketing was for kids. Yes. So there was that distinction. Still. Yes. Whereas I, they, I don't feel that distinction exists anymore. I'm uh, saying back then it I, did. And I agree. That's what I'm saying. I it's agree like, with you on that. Right. Now, but if you're now the films that, are... That, that it was never targeted that's, towards kids. No, no, no. Never no, no, no. I meant, kids. I meant the feature film. You're absolutely correct. Okay. After the first film, absolutely. They started... That's when they... Once, once it picked up, they started rolling out the toys. They had the comics. And it got progressively more into that. And, and then around Return of the Jedi, that's when it exploded well, and, into the crazy you know, marketing fair, that it was. That, was that, that speaks volumes to me because Return of the Jedi was the first film I saw. And yeah. that's because I was old enough to see it with my dad. And I remember going to see it with my dad. And I'm like, who's that guy in the black helmet? And dad uh, re- reached down to me and goes, okay, yeah, so that's, that's Luke's dad. Uh, he found out about that in the last film. You know, mm-hmm. and, and it's like, spoiler. Uh, no, when I, <laughs> and and that, that's what that experience was for me. So right. when I think of Star Wars, I don't think of the original movie, which my parents, set, I mean, they stuck me with a babysitter. And they went and saw it on their own. Yeah. And they had this super creepy, it was a super creepy scene. These guys with these white, uh, you know, sort of buckets on their head are coming out and they have no faces. Are they robots? We don't yeah. know what they are. Then this guy comes out, he's black. And he's like, is he a robot? Mm-hmm. Are these humans versus robots? What is this? And, and they're thinking in terms of Buck Rogers, they don't know right. Right. what this is. It was revolutionary. And, and, the th- and I had kind of had it, in a, I'm, I mean, I'm even, I'm even younger than you are. And like for... My experience with Star Wars was a little bit different where I saw – I didn't see any of them in, in theaters until they did the – The re-releases. Um, the re-releases. Sure. But I had seen all three of them from renting them on – actually, I had, I had the original VHS of yeah. Star Wars, and then I could only rent Empire and Return of the Jedi. That was how I saw them. So when I, And I saw them as a kid. Mm-hmm. So when I was a kid, 
I had no problem with Return of the Jedi because it was for kids, more for kids. As I got older and I went back and I've rewatched those movies multiple times. Mm-hmm. I, as as I'm sure you know, I'm very critical of movies. Sometimes annoys people that I go see movies with because I immediately want to nitpick the film. Doesn't mean I didn't like it. I just like to nitpick. Mm -hmm. But going back and rewatching those movies, for me, I can still, I can see the brilliance of Star Wars and I can see the tonal shift from After Empire into Return of the Jedi. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean I can't enjoy Return of the Jedi because I enjoyed that movie so much as a kid. And it still has powerful moments. That moment where Vader throws the Emperor over, you know, the, 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 the paneling and he goes into the, you know, core, the Death Star and all that. That's a powerful moment. And that moment where he takes off his helmet and he's like, oh, you saved me, Luke, and all that. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. still, I kind of, you know, I get goosebumps when I watch that scene. Getting a little, right now, just thinking about it. I mean, it's a powerful scene because of what they built up Vader to be in the previous two movies. Yeah, yeah. But overall, you know, the Ewok stuff and, and all, all of that was just, and, and some of the ways that they got into the facility, for example, like the um, Three Stooges skit that Han Solo pulls on the, on the Stormtrooper to get into the, yeah, um, yeah. you know, facility to turn off the, the shields for the Death Star. Um, little things like that. You would never see that in the first two movies. You know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a tonal shift. And I'm not saying it went from this is for college kids to this is for four-year-olds, but it was definitely a downshift. And I felt like when we got to the prequels, they continued that downshift. And now with TFA, there was a little bit of an attempt to upshift a little bit, but they're still definitely hitting around that, like, 12-year-old market, I feel. And then they're heavily, like, you're, like you were talking about, just like they did with after the first film mm-hmm. took off, but even more so, they have all of these other properties for young, very young kids. Yes, they do. Very young kids. Yes, they do. I got no problem with that. I'm just pointing out that and I have no problem, honestly, with Star Wars. If it's, if it's not going to be for me, that's fine. It doesn't have to be for me. I just, you know, as, so, as someone that is, it, it was so much part of my life, I, I do feel, I do lament that, it's, that it may not be anymore. And I'm, again, I'm speaking there prematurely. Was a, there was a period of time yeah. when we had no new Star Wars, like a decade, where we had no new anything well, from Star Wars. That's, that is, that, see, so, I was about to say that's not true. Uh, we had plenty. We had a lot from Star Wars. Just film. Not new I'm, film. Talking, I'm talking about we had, we had We had books. We had comic books. We had video games. Yeah. So, yeah, we did. And we had, we had a lot of things, Star Wars-related media. Some but a of lot was, of it was just recycled. Some of it, and some of it was great. Knights of the Old Republic. Okay. You know, um, the TIE Fighter games. You know, there those, those were there were some really good experiences, um, and then of course, when it comes to you know books, there were some there were some horrible, horrible Star Wars books, no doubt. I was huge into yeah, I, I, I read I read them all. There's a period where I just literally read them all. Yeah, but there were some that were excellent. So I, I really do feel like um, you know it was something that was part of my life for such a long period. Um, when we come into expectations. That's why when I go into t- to for- the Force Awakens, that's why when I went into the prequels, I had all these expectations. Mm-hmm. And I was just in high school when the pre- school- prequels came out, and I had a ton of expectations for those movies. Mm-hmm. And that was probably my first experience of just complete the, disappointment. the complete disappointment of, of watching Phantom Menace, just like, it's so good. <laughs> like one of those, like you're trying to convince yourself that it's not horrible, right. but you know that it yeah, is. Yeah. Um, and with Force Awakens... Of course, I'm not saying it's that level. I'm not. It is It is an all right, it's an okay movie. But is it a great movie? No. Honestly, Rogue One is my favorite Star Wars movie. I, I liked agree. it more. Yeah. More it's, than... It's my favorite. More than Empire Strikes Back? Yeah, or the more, than, more than any of the others. Rogue One is my favorite movie because it it doesn't try to be more than it is. It's I like that about it. Story. How many times have you seen it, though? I have seen it four times. Really? Yes. Because I've, I've seen it twice, and on the second time... There were some. There was definitely some some moments that kind of dragged, in my opinion. In my opinion, sure. In my opinion, but well, maybe it's not for you, Jim. Uh, well, no, it it is a good movie. I think <laughs> I think part of the thing with Rogue One that to me lowers it a bit is that it's not. It's Star Wars, but it's not. You know, it's like because it's a different sort of story. Okay, it's in the Star Wars universe, but it's not really. I think Star that's Wars. my point. Actually, <laughs> is that it? It's so far removed from the the typical story arc, and yet it's still got people in the Star Wars universe. Then how can it be the best Star Wars story. if it's not really Star Wars? You see what I'm saying? No, it, it, it's Star Wars. It like is the you story he that. likes most that has Star Wars on the cover. Right. Yeah, That's what I'm go. saying. It's like, if it's if it's such a tonal shift from... Anyway, we're getting... But this well, goes that, into that, expectations. That, that, that it goes into point. expectations. Are, are you right. expecting a certain thing from Star I am. Wars? Are I exactly am. Clearly yeah. he is. I yeah. am expecting something very... Mm. And, yeah. and, you know, is that my fault? Maybe. I mean, it's not my well, fault. It's and, just, the, and that brings us yeah. to a really interesting place to conclude this, yeah. mm-hmm. which is that now 
it is so old. As a franchise, it is so old. We could look at Star Trek, we could, which we haven't even talked about. Oh, God, we yeah. Could look we could at do a whole show Wars. about that. Uh, you know, we can look at any of these franchises that are old enough for a generation to have kids, mm -hmm. which are now experiencing the soft reboots. We didn't even talk about the Battlestar Galactica and how that reboot yeah. was so different from the original. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I think what would really come down to whenever we talk about that is it is impossible. It is impossible for us to continue something without basically having the fans, someone who was a fan, be creating it, which by definition makes it fan fiction, even if it's good franchised. Good point. That's a very good even point. Even if it's franchised. Yeah. So I, even though it is my favorite of the Star Wars films, I will be the very first to say that unabashedly, Rogue One is a fan film. It's the best fan film that's ever been made for Star Wars, but it is completely and totally a fan film. And so is episode seven, and so will episode eight be. And that's okay. Fan film is not a dirty word. 99.9% .9 of fan fiction is pretty terrible, <laughs> but it's done in love. Hmm. It's, it's terrible love, but it's love. And that's, what I, that's where I really wanted to, to, to point out with all of this is that unless you've got a person who is creating a thing, and video games don't ever have that. You might have a lead creative person or you might have a lead writer or a lead well, some video games don't have that anymore. Would right. Be more that's that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah, that's correct. That's correct. But like unless you're looking at like a Ken Levine and No, but even then. Uh, no, no, you cannot he, he has a storied history himself. But you cannot even see I don't think you can even with him still, he might have been the main creative force. It's like it's like Miyamoto now oh, with some of the newer the games, right? Yeah. It's like Miyamoto with the newer Great Mario examples. games. He you could say, Oh, he had all this influence and he, of course he did, but he was really just the lead right. on a team, just like just like a Ken Levine. Massive team. We're not talking about games back in the NES era or yeah. earlier, like the Atari era, where there yeah. was only like two people. Right. That's a team. Yeah. That's a big difference from yeah. nowadays. Or or the poor guy who made I forget his name, but the poor guy who made E. T. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that guy yeah. was actually brilliant. He was, he right. was really, really good and he got just pooped on. Poor guy. But I guess I guess really where I want to when I come to with all of this is to say that we are in a weird gray zone now mm -hmm. where stuff that is sort of brought up next to and adjacent to and not quite uh, a part of the franchise actually has the franchise label slapped onto it right. and now is part of the franchise. And I think Rogue One is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so many other things, all these little spin-off games. I mentioned Assassin's Creed before. Uh, one of the best settings in Assassin's Creed actually is the China one, but that's a side scroller. And it's like to even call that an Assassin's Creed game is just blasphemy. Yeah. Well, look look at all the Mario and the Mario spinoffs too, where we have um, oh good examples. like like um, Super Mario. What is it? What was it called? The that three Mario Kart garbage. Yeah. No, I was no, I was talking kidding. about the. Joking. It was on. It was on Wii. It was like um, a sort of a platformer, sort of an RPG. Uh, Super Paper Mario. Yes, yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. That was like, what is that? Is that a is that a Paper Mario game? Is that a Super Mario game? It's like kind of this weird mm -hmm. hybrid. It was an awesome game in my opinion. Yeah, I thought it was actually, <laughs> yeah. it, was it, was, really, it, was it was a really fun game. But no, but so we have all these expectations and some people hated the game because they're like, I want this to be Mario. Mm -hmm. I want this to be a platform Mario. And some of them were like, I want this to be Paper Mario. And it was neither. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess my encouragement to everyone would simply be this. Um, have a little bit of an open mind as we continue to experiment and innovate and try new things because we, whenever something comes out and it's the, just a reskin of the same thing over and over and over again, we complain. And whenever it is uh, something that's so completely new and, and unlike anything we've seen before, we've never seen it before and it just blows our minds in a bad way, we complain but it's the stuff in the middle there. There's some kind of a happy middle zone. Like we were saying earlier. Yeah, and, and that's what we're looking for is that just slight that, tweak that's just barely off. The right yeah. mix of the familiar and the new. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I, and I think that if we can collectively start pinpointing those things, especially from some indie developers and, and you know some of the smaller companies and, and really kind of bring those up and out and say, hey, look, this is the type of game that mm -hmm. dot, dot, dot. We didn't talk about it. Witcher 3. Which do more of that. Do more example. of that, please. Yeah. Do, <laughs> more. More of that. More, more. But more of the right thing. More, right. And and not if you copy Witcher three, it'll be awful. Sure. Because exactly. it won't be the Witcher. Right. And and that's the point. Don't steal Geralt of Rivia. That's not the part you steal. What you steal is the stuff that was really fun about that, which was the open world, a completely rich environment, maybe fantasy elements, maybe not. Uh, detailed lore. Detailed lore. Yeah. It, that's the part you steal. Yeah. 
Thank you for joining us, everyone, for episode 116 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, our discussion on consumer expectations and franchises and all that sort of fun stuff. Uh, and always, we'd like to remind you that we are uh, trying to grow the show. So any way you can help us as far as uh, sharing the show with your friends, uh, giving five-star reviews on iTunes will actually help with um, searchability quite a bit. Don't start. stop at five either. Give us six. Yeah, give us give us six. Uh, break the system until it uh, <laughs> until you can give a six-star review. Um and just generally, uh, we'd love to have you engage with the show. So as we say at the end of every episode, uh, feel free to write into Inbox. Uh, it doesn't even have to be directly related to something we talked about on the show. It could be something you'd like to hear us talk about, um, just anything that's interesting to you. And uh, we will feature you either on Inbox or sometimes even make a full uh, full episode out of it. Uh, so anyway, until we see you next time, I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.